Uh, well, great. Good to have you guys here. We are uh, we're continuing on in our teaching series called Portraits of Israel as uh, we're cruising along in the Eat This Book Challenge. We're challenging the whole church to read through the Bible this year to form the daily habit of opening the scriptures every single day. How's that going for you? Yeah, yeah, okay. So uh, I should be going to be finishing the book of Judges in just a few days here. And uh, on Tuesday, I believe, you're going to come across uh, one of the shortest books in the Old Testament. It's a little four chapter, maybe two pages in your Bible. It's a little book of... Little Book of Ruth, yeah, it comes after Judges. One of the shortest reads in the Old Testament. And so uh, we're going to camp out in Ruth today, which, you know, almost never happens because not many people pay attention to this little book in the Old Testament. But to kind of help us uh, understand the significance of Ruth, this is a profound, profound short story. And to consider uh, its profundity, that's a fun word to say, profundity, uh, we we need to uh, play a little game. Uh, We need to look at some options optical illusion puzzles, because naturally that has everything to do with the book of Ruth, yes? So uh, here's, here's what's going to happen. You're just going to see some images, and one image appear on the screen. It's one of these uh, high zoom, super close in images, right? And then you have to guess what it is. So you, like, you know what all of these objects are, but when you see it up close, you're like, what? You guys, know, have you seen these before? I loved playing these when I was a kid. Okay, so you're going to see an image here, first one. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Hmm. Should I sing the Jeopardy hymn? I don't know. Uh, hmm. No, it's corny. So, anybody? Anybody? Celery. Celery. That's exactly right. Look at that. Stick a C. Did you see it? A few of you. This is brilliant. That's brilliant. Okay. It's brilliant. Okay. Right, let's keep going. Keep going. Don't let the food genre trick you here. Let's go for the next one. <laughs> this is very entertaining. <laughs> okay, you guys ready? Time's up. Time's up. Let me go. It's a strike pad of a matchbox, right? <laughs> see that? Do you see that there? It's a matchbox. I love these. These are so much fun. This is so entertaining. All right, let's do, let's do one more. Let's do one more. Last image here. Hmm. Hmm. This is the best one, in my opinion. Anybody? Anybody? All right. You ready for action? It's a nickel. Exactly right. Exactly right. Do you see it? What? This is my favorite one. Right? So this is so brilliant. Okay. All right. So why are we doing this? This has everything to do with the book of Ruth. Trust me. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> it's also a good way to wake up in the morning, but uh, better than Sudoku puzzles, I think. So here, let's keep, let's keep it up there real quick here. So here's what's going on visually. All right. At least this is, this is like what brain scientists tell us is going on, right? With, with, so our, our, our eyes are locking in on the up close photo and we just have this mass of visual input, just details. And that's fine. Like our eyes do a great job of making sense of details or something. But what we need more than just visual input is context, right? Like as visual details can mean a whole bunch of different things. Before I saw that was a nickel, it just looks like, you know, how many of you see the eyes now? Yeah, totally. And you, you could never look at it, you know, the way you did the first time without, without seeing it. Because, oh, of course, those are eyes. But before, it looked like these massive scratches and swiggles and so on. So that's precisely right. Our brains, the way our brains interpret visual data, the massive random details, is we, our brains are locking onto a context. What's the bigger picture that will give these details meaning and so on? This is such a great, this is great. I can't wait to play this with Roman, right? But this is such a great image for what what's going on in our brains, but also how we interpret a lot more than just visual data. This is a great metaphor for how most of us live our lives. So let me just ask you the question. Which of those two pictures characterizes, you know, basically how you interpret your day-to-day life for the most part, right? So we live in the mass of details, right? We live in the mass of just of data and things that happen to us. So I hope, you know, you brushed your teeth when you came here this morning. I hope uh, you maybe had some breakfast or something and you go on throughout the rest of your day. Maybe you'll get in an argument or something and, and maybe you'll resolve that argument. You might play with your kids or go hang out with a friend, maybe eat a meal and so on. And then you might, and then you might go to bed. What was the meaning of all of that? Like, what's the point, you know? What's the meaning? 
Well, to ask what the meaning of any given random event in my life is, is to ask a question of context. Like, well, what's the bigger picture that my life fits into? Where was I yesterday? Where am I going in five years from now? Yesterday's meal that I ate might be meaningless, but if the conversation I had over that meal was a life changing conversation that sets the trajectory of my life, then you would say that that event has me, it's a bigger picture. You guys see what I'm saying here? We live most of our lives immersed in the random super high zoom details. And it's actually very difficult to discern the bigger picture of what's going on in our lives, at least for me. I don't, maybe you have like hyper discernment or something like that. I, I don't know. Most of us don't. We're just, random stuff happens all day long and we're like, well, why is that person in my life? I would prefer that they were not. You know, you know, like what's the meaning of that person in my life? What's the meaning of this job or this thing that's happening to me right now? And this is, this is part of just human experience. This is part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Is to begin to ask the question, what is the larger picture that the, the massive details in my life fit into? So we, we now, we're almost three months, we're, three months, three months and 18 days, is today the 18th? Holy cow, I should know that detail, yeah, this is the 18th, all right, here I am. And uh, so we're, we're, uh, we're March 18th into Eat This Book Challenge. Great story so far? Yeah, it's a thrilling story. It's a star-studded cast, right? Noah and Abraham and Moses, and it's exciting, and it's the Red Sea, and right? all these exciting events. And we're reading these events, and we're just going, okay, that's cool that these events happened to those people, right? But, uh, you know, most of us have never had these kinds of experiences before that are being talked about in the Bible. We just live in the day today of brushing our teeth and conversation and going to work and so on. And so clearly God's at work in this story. This is the story of how God is at work to redeem and to save and bring blessing to the world. But what about my little story you know, of brushing my teeth and getting into an argument and playing with your kids? You know? Where's the story of my life? And how does it fit into this big story? It's a natural question that we ask. And there is a book of the Bible that's completely dedicated to exploring that reality. That yes, that's great that God's story is going on somewhere out there, but what about my little story? Does my little story at all fit into what God is doing in the world? And the little book of Ruth comes alongside. It tells you a, a story about a bunch of no-name people living in a small village. And it says absolutely every detail, every day of your life is woven into the bigger story that God is telling. Every conversation, every choice is significant because you never know what situation, what circumstance is going to weave your life into the work that God is doing in the world. That's the point of the book of Ruth. Now here's, uh, here's the thing, is that the book of Ruth is actually very short. It takes about 15 minutes to read it aloud. So let's strike a deal. Let's say you get a free day on Tuesday for Eat This Book Challenge, and let's say we just read the whole book right now. What do you think? Yeah, done, done. All right, we're going to do it. You don't really get a choice in the matter. I decided this a while ago, so it's all right. So, and, uh, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to invite uh, uh, some good folks out here to, we're going to have like a dramatic reading of the book of Ruth. It's an it's a, it's a attention-grabbing short story. So I'm going to invite uh, these good people out. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> This uh, is uh, Lisa O'Brien. She's going to be the narrator and a bunch of minor characters. Uh, Connie Sue Prochnow. She's going to be Naomi. This is Katie Martins, who's going to uh, be Ruth. And Matt Winsenreed, who's going to be Boaz. You kind of have to stretch it out and say it sexy like Boaz. Because he's kind of, <laughs> kind of like the hero of the story. So, uh, you guys ready? Ready for action? Yeah, let's just, uh, let's just dive in. Here, here we go. You can open your Bibles if you like, or just uh, listen. Listen as we go. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Machlon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. 
they married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Machlon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and told her that they would go back with her to her people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Oh, return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is bitter for me, more than you, because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, Ruth, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them, and the women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, because the Lord Almighty has made my life Mara very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. So the story begins. It's just an average Israelite family. And there's a famine in the land. Now, just to situate us, because this is important for how the geography of the story works, I'll show you a quick map here. So they live uh, in Bethlehem, which uh, is the town in which David and Jesus will, will later be born and grow. And, uh, and Bethlehem is located just right, as you can see it there, in the southern part of the hill country, uh, it's to the, the, uh, the west of the Dead Sea. There's a famine in the land. And so what this involves is this family, this Israelite family, they cross down, they go up uh, to the north end of the Dead Sea, they cross the River Jordan and up into the hill country of Moab. Now, if you've been tracking in the storyline so far, the Moab, M- the Moabites, good guys, bad guys, They're bad guys, actually. They're bad guys. They have had a tense relationship with the people of Israel that will result in wars on and off, on and off for about a century and a half. But they're forced to go there because of the food shortage. And so while they're there, tragedy strikes. The, The men of this family die. And so the women of the family return. One turns back, but this Moabite woman, right? You're suspicious of her because of everything else you know about Moabites in the story of the Bible. But this Moabite woman wants Yahweh to be her God. She shows faithfulness to her mother-in-law. It's just random people, tragedy, moving about, famine, being faithful. Is this how God is at work in these people's stories? Let's keep reading. 
Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. They answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, Who does that woman belong to? The overseer replied, She is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, There, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, My daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field, and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the harvesters are working and follow along after the women. I've told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you're thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. How you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live amongst a people you did not know before? May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wing you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord. You have reassured me and have spoken kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. It's mealtime now. Come over here, have some bread, and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men. Let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered and it amounted to about 30 pounds. She carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. Where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz. The Lord bless him. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. That man is our close relative. He is one of our family guardians. He even said to me, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. It will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him, because in someone else's field, you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to to glean until the barley and wheat harvest were finished. And she lived with her mother-in-law. So this was a very common situation in, in ancient Israel. A tragedy strikes. A husband dies. And in Israelite culture, again, this is an ancient, traditional, patriarchal culture, the status of widows in Israel was very, very vulnerable. Husbands were landowners, and they were protectors of the family. The husband's gone. Someone comes, could come and buy up the land. The woman could become potentially homeless, taken advantage of, and so on. And so you have two widows who come back. And lo and behold, it's, it's the harvest time. And what field would they happen to find themselves in? Well, it's Boaz's field. And wouldn't you know it, Boaz is a relative. And do you see where the story's going here? This is, it's random coincidences. But this is God working his story in and through the tragedy and the decisions and their moving and the details, the random, so-called random details of their choices. 
In ancient Israel, this family guardian, or some of your translations might have redeemer or kinsman redeemer. This was a cultural practice in Israel, where in, in the extended family. So if there's a, another set of family members, a cousin or a distant cousin or so on, and there's a tragedy, husband dies, someone dies, it would be this person's obligation to protect that part of the extended family, to perhaps buy the land so it doesn't get taken away from the family, to marry the widow so that she comes into his house and is cared for and taken, taken care of. Boaz is the redeemer, the protector of Naomi, and now Ruth, this Moabite. This is awkward. And what is, what is Boaz's response to this situation? He's generous to these poor widows. He protects them. He's obeying the Torah. That's what he's doing. Love your neighbor as yourself. So what's going to happen? How is God going to use these decisions and random details to work out his story? Let's keep, let's keep reading. One day, Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Now Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash and perfume yourself and put on your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know that you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? I am your servant, Ruth. Spread the cut corner of your garment over me, since you are a family guardian. The Lord bless you, my daughter. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I'll do for you all that you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true I am a family guardian, there is another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to do his duty as your family guardian, good. Let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized. And he said, No one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. Bring the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and put it on her. Then he went back to town. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, How did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, He gave me these six measures of barley, saying, Don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. This would be a good soap opera, yeah? (laughs) So so this is kind of the sketchy scene, right? Ruth gets all, like, dressed up and so on, and, like, goes at night to the threshing floor, you know, and he's sleeping. You know what I'm saying? You kind of, we're like, what is is going on here? So, again, this is cultural background. So Ruth would have been in this whole time in a period of mourning and grieving, Right? And you would indicate that by not, not putting on makeup or oil or perfume, uh, by wearing very plain clothes. And so Naomi is telling Ruth, you need to indicate to Boaz that you're available, essentially. So change your clothes. Tell everyone in public, I'm no longer in mourning for my dead husband. I've transitioned, I, I'm now available. <laughs> That's what she's doing. 
And so it's this kind of this kind of questionable scene. I mean, Ruth, the Moabite, has to be very bold to go at night to be seen. I mean, Boaz is a very upstanding man in the community. He's a hardworking man, man of principle, man of character. And there's this Moabite at night. Did you hear about Ru- Ruth and Boaz? And so, so she goes at night. But Ruth, she's, she's very earnest, isn't she? She says, please protect us. We're vulnerable. We need shelter. We need protection. And what is Boaz? He steps up right to the plate. But there's this other guy who never gets named in the story, this other family, Redeemer. What's going to happen? Is God going to use Boaz's character and hardworking, principled man? Or is it going to be some mystery man? We don't know. We don't know. Dun, 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 dun. Right? So let's finish the story. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat down there just as the family guardian he had mentioned came along. Boaz said, Come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Then Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and asked them to sit down, and they did so. Then he said to the family guardian, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling this piece of of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I I should bring this matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. He said, I will redeem it. On the day that you buy the land from Naomi, you will also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the family guardian said, Then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Now in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the family guardian said to Boaz, Buy it yourself. And he removed his sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon. I have acquired Ruth the Moabite, Malon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear among his family or from his hometown. Today you are witnesses. Then the elders and all the people at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a family guardian. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This, then, is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz. Boaz, the father of Obed. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of David. Let's give these guys a hand. (laughs) Awesome. Thanks, you guys. And that's the story, <laughs> right? So this is strange. How random, right? So why is the story in the Bible? 
right? I think that's a question many of us might be asking. So it's interesting, right? Learn about culture and history and so on. So what's the meaning, you know? It's like we're looking at celery up close and that's interesting, but what's, how does it fit in? Actually, did you see how it fits in? See, we as readers, we brush right over this. Did you, the last part that you were bored at, the last sentences, right? What was that? That was a genealogy, right? So what's a gene- in the Bible, genealogies are ways of tracking God's faithfulness through the stories of people through history. Right? And what was the last name in that genealogy? David. David. You notice the book of Judges ended with chaos and virtual anarchy and moral corruption among the people of Israel. And the end of the book of Judges says, we need a king. We need- there was no king and everybody's doing what they want. And the book of Samuel is going to introduce... Whom to you? (laughs) Saul and David. David, the king, Israel's king. Israel's king. (laughs) See, what the the storyteller is is brilliant. What the storyteller's doing, right there with that little genealogy, he's giving you the high high zoom. (laughs) He's he's backing up and letting you see the whole whole context. And out of these, these three people, there's no name people living in this little village, their stories would be lost to history. A hundred or so years after they're dead and everyone who knows them is dead. It turns out that those small decisions in a, in a barley field, on a threshing floor, at the city gate, those were the events through which God would bring Israel's king, David, through whom God would send Israel's Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, through whom you and I are reconciled to God. Do you see this here? It's the big story in the little story. And so this is what the book of Ruth is trying to get us to do here. It's offering us three portraits of how God works in people's lives, in the random details, right? So you have someone like Naomi and tragedy strikes. And she interprets this as God hates her, right? At the beginning of the story. She's like, God's punishing me. He's attacking me. Is that true? That's what it feels like. But is it the case, as the storyteller is going to reveal, that God did not plan these events? He's not responsible for them. The story doesn't say that. But he's able to redeem. He's able to take this tragedy and weave in her life a story of redemption. Weave her into his big story of him sending the Redeemer. You have this, this, this foreigner, right? This outsider, Ruth. And she's bold, right? Like she breaks social convention. She's like, I want Yahweh to be my God and I'm going with you and I don't care about the stigma that's gonna happen to me if I go back to the land of Israel. I'm gonna go. And God, God uses her bold initiative to go to the threshing floor at night, like breaking all these social customs. And God uses, he honors her, her boldness, her faithfulness and weaves her into his story. And you have Boaz who's just, you know, he's an older guy. He didn't think he was really that attractive anymore, right? He read that in the story. And he's like, I don't know, I'm just kind of, you could have gone after somebody else. He's a principal, he's a hardworking man. He's built a reputation in the village over time because he does what's right and he does it every day. He's made the right decision 10,000 times before. And then it comes to it, one small decision to be generous, to fulfill his responsibilities. And God uses that to weave Boaz into his story. Who do you identify with? Right? The exiled Naomi in pain, in tragedy. Do you identify with Ruth, the outsider? Right? The one who gets stereotyped. The one who's called to obey God in ways that doesn't make sense to other people. Or maybe even to you sometimes. But you, you do that. You, you take bold steps. You take risks. <laughs> Or you're like Boaz, you're just plodding, you just do the right thing, you have the same thing for breakfast every day, you know what I mean, you just, you do the right thing, hard working, principle, and God honors that, God honors that. See, what the story is training us to do is to look for the, the fingerprints of God at work in our everyday lives, right? And to see Every decision, every conversation, every day you get up, every relationship, every person in our lives, you never know (laughs) what moment, what conversation is going to weave together into the big story that God's weaving in our world and you and I are a part of it because we are a part of the story. That's the point of the book of Ruth.
If we're followers of the Messiah Jesus, we are a part of the story. We're woven in to what God is doing here. So you may want to read the book of Ruth again on Tuesday, but I would encourage you, find your story. Let the book raise questions for you. How is God working in my life? How is he using people and circumstances and events that I maybe can't understand right now? But how could this be part of a bigger, bigger picture? This is the book of Ruth. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. So let it speak to you. Let God speak to you through, through the book of Ruth. We have some time to reflect here as we end the service and I would just encourage you to think about these three characters. What's God saying to you? What are circumstances in your life that you don't understand and Ruth is, is trying to help you see a bigger picture? Let me close us uh, with a word of prayer as we transition. Lord, we thank you for the brilliance and the power of your word, of these short stories to, to embody your message to us, how you've drawn us into your story. And God, there are some of us here who are struggling to even believe there is a story in our lives, that there is a pattern, there is meaning. There are some of us who we've lost our way. There's some of us who've turned away from your story and you're bringing us back. There's some of us who have been trying to do the right thing day after day, year after year. Lord, would you use your word uh, to bring illumination to the random mass of details that make up our lives? Would you give us wisdom and insight through your word? We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.